Manny has given me the great gift of feedback on my research, right? So, you know, sometimes I'll publish a piece I'm really proud of, and Manny will call me in this very humble way and say, eh, Laura, maybe you should think about it this way. I love that about Manny. But Manny, tell the group a little bit about your role in Intel and analytics and what brings you here today. Thank you, Laura. So definitely it goes for 10 years or more, our uh -huh. association. I remember our discussions, panel sessions, and in fact, I was uh, at a conference probably five, four years ago. You were at the first conference. Yeah. Uh, talking about analytics. So what a change you're going to see from where we talked and where I'm going to be talking. I'm really excited about your presentation. <laughs> I'm not going to stand so, in the way of it. You already heard my name. I'm with Intel, and uh, primarily uh, my role is uh, in supply chain, but I kind of look at analytics and uh, the transformation across the factories. I'm, I'm a factory guy. I used to be in the factory as well. So trying to integrate everything across the board and getting the value, ROI, always matters, right? And you already laid the path for some of the things I'm going to talk about. But uh, before I do that, How many of you have used this paper map maybe 10 years ago? Going to a new place, pull, you know, get into a, you know, your uh, rental car, pull out the paper map. <sighs> right? Today, how many of you are not using Google or Siri? Any hands? What happened to us? Technology, culture, everything kind of melded into one solving the problem, right? So the reason I'm kind of talking about uh, this particular situation is hold on to this thought, you're gonna get there. But uh, I just wanna kind of share with you a few things about Intel, not that uh, you, know, like, uh, you haven't heard of Intel, one of the biggest semiconductor companies. And uh, we're not just a PC company anymore. We are into what we call as the compute. And uh, providing, uh, in fact, with our uh, acquisition of uh, you know, Mobileye, you know, we are also into the autonomous driving, not autonomous supply chain yet. So we'll, we'll get there. And uh, so kind of quickly going through where our supply chain and Intel you know, like, kind of what's the impact? I kind of laid out some of these numbers from last year, you know, 70 plus billion dollar, 100,000 plus employees, and, uh, but if you look at some of these numbers, right, supply chain has its hand across the board, whether it is a revenue, whether it is a cost. We are very capital asset intensive, so we spend around $15 billion, give or take uh, you know, a billion on capital and our cost of sales, $27 billion, and our you know, like, uh, real estate, you know, is, we have like seven fabs around the world. So the supply chain is involved from a product, from a design for supply chain, from a product, you know, sales and marketing. Uh, in fact, now we call the IBP, Integrated uh, Business Planning. And uh, so we have uh, all the details that go into what to build, when to build, where to build, who the customers, what's the competition, how the market look like, all the way down to what the components and where the ODMs and all the details, right? So we have a whole lot of uh, activities we are engaged. So in order to make our product, the next product, which is, you know, like which we want to touch the life of everybody, we're looking at a uh, few things. One is, how do we continue to provide our technology leadership? Again, how many of you have heard of Moore's Law? Wow, that is a staggering number. Thank you. So I'm not going to say what it is, but uh, the reason why our compute devices are much more smarter, uh, meaning you can compute uh, billions of transactions in seconds, and uh, you can actually put it in your pocket, as well as you can afford it, is all the result of what has happened almost 40 years ago when uh, Gordon Moore, our founder, actually now we yeah, celebrated 50 years last year, decided on a napkin that, hey, this is the cost of transistors should come down by 50% every 18 months. 
while the size should reduce by 50%, while the compute power should be 2x. So we are still living true to that. There are a lot of you know, like uh, challenges around it, but uh, that's what makes supply chain challenging. In fact, some of the equipment we have to buy to make this Moore's law happen could be upwards of $100 million. And it could take up to 12 months to 18 months. That's a long capital acquisition. So we got to plan, and sometimes it just so happens that the technology and the market changes by the time you have a $2 billion fab built. So how do you plan for all those things? How do we implement them? How do we being agile? So the resilient supply chain is very critical. In fact, we do some of the things like options in our supply chain as well. And we want to do all these things while being responsible. And uh, in fact, uh, Intel supply chain is, uh, I mean, Intel as a corporation is uh, you know, like among the top CSR, corporate social responsible uh, companies. And we have transistor, you know, like lead-free, and then you know, like uh, uh, conflict-free minerals. A lot of activities around making sure that we are responsible citizens. And how do we hit all these, you know, like uh, requirements together? By making our supply chain more agile and smart. And uh, what we're talking about today is going to be some of the digital transformation. And uh, so when I was sharing this with you, the paper became digital, but we still look at the maps, right? So I'm going to get to the autonomous piece as well. But the reason why things are happening the way they are happening is because the technology has evolved around us, whether it is the data. We heard about the IoT in the morning, right? I mean, enabling sensors and actuators to you know, make uh, our decisions smarter. Or the memory, you know, like in fact, uh, there are a lot of in-process memory uh, yeah, things that we don't have to pull data, store data, analyze data, feedback, and into the dashboards, right? So we can actually do it on the fly. And the reasoning with the AI and ML has really been changing. We went from data to big data to sometimes people say small data, but big data, and to unstructured data. So a lot of, in fact, the unstructured data is growing at almost uh, 3x the size of a regular data. So if you're not able to harness the value out of those, we are missing out. So those are some of the things we're talking about, cognitive reasoning, machine learning, artificial intelligence. These are all buzzwords, really. But when you start using them and applying them, they start to provide the value that was hidden. And I'm going to share some of those in my presentation. And uh, the compute power, as I mentioned, you know, like whether it is uh, connectivity, whether it is graph, you know, like graphic related, computer related, it has grown leaps and bounds. So when you put them all together, magic happens. So I'm going to, this is the picture I was trying to show, right? From a paper map to a digital navigation is what the industry has moved. And 10 years from now, maybe our kids, maybe ourselves, right? We will just go to our car. The car or the vehicle knows who you are, where you want to go. You get into the back seat. It takes you where you're going. You don't have to pull up your navigation. So that is a true autonomous, right? How did that happen in the autonomous industry? Because as you can see, the data and the business process have evolved. So that provided a lot of opportunities for automation. Along the same time, the insight from data to information to insight has become deep and rich through the application of uh, you know, predictive, prescriptive, and cognitive. And when you start putting them all together, that is where the autonomous, you know, like I know the ecosystem, I know what is happening out there, I, I know exactly what it takes, and then when with the sensors and data, navigating across the whole ecosystem is where it's happening. Now let's talk about supply chain and operations, right? Why is that it's not happening at the pace? In fact, there's a question that was asked earlier, are we there yet? I'm still asking that question. We have started the journey. Hopefully, we'll be there sooner. But it has to come in pieces. I think there are a lot of different things that have to happen, not just the technology. So I kind of put this together. I was hearing to some of the discussions and comments yesterday, so I went back and put that small, you know, like a picture at the bottom. Because without talent, 
nothing happens. We all know that. We're all here, right? Without culture, you can have the best solution, best technology out there. But if the culture are adopting a new technology or a new way of thinking is not there. In fact, you heard from PNG. Uh, so, you know, like the way the innovation happens, the way that adaptation happens, right, Andrew? So I think those are all critical. Let's say that I have the talent that can actually, you know, provide a vision and also can, you know, get into the, you know, like details. But do we have the strategy connecting from customer to product to business to supply chain? Do I have the strategy to make it happen? That is more critical. From my perspective, what I believe is we need those four pillars to work together to make the autonomous digital supply chain in the future. So with that in mind, I kind of mentioned talent. In fact, Laura was saying, man, you talk about talent because you, know, like you have a tendency to jump into technology. Yes, I do. But bringing me back, thank you. So I kind of thought about it. Again, I put my slide last night on this one. How we nurture talent within Intel. Big company, 100,000 employees, but by, within my group, I have, uh, my group is a small group of 15 data engineers, data scientists, and solution architects, and then I work across like 100 uh, you know, metrics uh, in different groups. Uh, so we, we kind of make sure that, you know, do we hire right? Do we project our image as Intel, as a progressive company? You know, like believing in people, doing the right thing, being a good corporate citizen, and having the best product out there, creating the best customer experiences that attracts people. And then hiring, right? We have very good system in place. In fact, we engage with, you know, most of you are doing this, right? Engaging with universities early on. We sit on consortias. In fact, we cross uh, uh, work on research. We fund projects. We bring students on research as well as, uh, you know, like as interns. And uh, in fact, our goal is to convert 90% of those, you know, like young and aspiring intelligent interns to full-time. Before they complete their internship, we offer them the job. This is more critical, particularly when you start thinking about data scientists. It's very hard to find the right kind of data scientists who are willing to get out of their cube and go mingle with the subject matter experts. So th those are the kind of things we look for. Because if you, everything starts with asking the right questions, or for that matter, asking the question. So once you ask the question, then we can connect everything else, the data, the, how to convert data to information, how do we convert, you know, like the value proposition, as we said, should be there, right? At the same time, having the innovative mentality as well is critical. So we have a, created an innovation lab within supply chain, and we partnership, partner externally, internally, and our destination is fail fast, learn from it, move on. And having that opportunity for the folks to come in and not get you know, like, uh, put in a role day, on, day in and day out, they kind of like it. They like the challenges. In fact, my team works on procurement one day, and I say one day, you know, like the projects, right? Uh, planning, logistics, because what you have is the tools in your toolbox that is applicable across the board. And uh, Laura and I were also talking about the reason why the digitization is becoming harder is we have been trained to think in silos, planning, procurement, logistics. And our uh, great enterprise systems have been designed so beautifully to work along those lines. So the moment you start talking about digitization, autonomous, you gotta break that barrier. That means when you're bringing somebody in, you're not gonna bring somebody in for a particular role. You're gonna bring them for their you know, intuition, their skills, and their willingness to challenge the status quo. So those are some of the things we look for, and then we make sure that we have training and uh, opportunities as they go along in the company. So a lot of, lot of activities, you know, we also have center of excellence, and then uh, we, you know, like we have uh, Shark Tank kind of activities where we have uh, innovation project. In fact, I have a $100,000 yearly budget, uh, approximately, to try out different projects for different people. They come in, one time it was 3D printing, other time it was, uh, more like, uh, hey, I'm gonna go try blockchain. I said, okay, what's your end goal? Who the subject matter expert? They wanna engage with you. How do we see this happening? And uh, not you know, encumbering them with 
hey, you know what, you got to implement it. There, there is a role for you to take an informed risk. So we kind of play that along as well, maybe slightly different from some of the discussions you heard earlier. So I kind of believe in sharing some of these examples because there was a question earlier that, hey, you know, show us some of this autonomous or the digital supply chain, right? So some of the elements that go into the autonomous digital supply chain is primarily the different types of data. I, I kind of look at it as, you know, simplify, standardize, automate, autonomate. That's the kind of step I try to approach. And uh, also, the things that we're doing, you know, we used to call simulation modeling. We've been, do we've been doing that for like 30 plus years. Now there is a new word, digital twin. So I was like excited when somebody said digital twin, of course, GE and everything, and then we started looking at it. It was basically understanding your factory or your system or your supply chain, putting that you know, on a virtual you know, system and then enabling the right KPIs and then running them along and then making sure that you are able to connect into your business. And so what we did in that particular case was since we have several outsourcing functions, internally we have developed a you know, glass line, you know, like a, what we call as a pipeline. We have right KPIs and uh, the KPIs primarily is like what we call as a KPI pyramid because at different levels, different people want to know. If I'm talking to the supply chain executive, when they're looking at uh, you know, customer uh, facing uh, KPI, they would say, show me the perfect order, show me the order fulfillment lead time, for example, right? And then show me the you know, uh, cost of goods, inventory turns, right? But when I start going into the warehouse, or when I go into the transportation, line, or when I go into the planning, different metrics but they all need to connect. Or when I go into the factory, you know, like what's my yield? What's my throughput? What's my uh, you know, defectivity rates? Which particular product? So, so when we start combining them, the visualization tower gets built up. And then there are different types of algorithms that go in there, but we need to connect them. But I have three examples here. And in a, you know, like when I start putting a data pyramid, right, analytics, the first one kind of talks to the modeling and simulation and uh, we use it for strategic planning, we use it for tactical, and then we use it for visualization across our you know, like various, uh, what we call as the ODMs. We want to know how the ODMs are performing, so we can pull that information, and that way we can connect it to our planning and supply. And uh, then we have uh, you know, like, uh, visibility, as we heard, right? It's very critical. And uh, leveraging IoT and our technology, we, and also kind of uh, infusing algorithms and analytics, we are able to go from you know, descriptive diagnostics to predictive visibility is something that I'm going to share. And the last example is how do we get value out of you know, various uh, information, unstructured data. In this particular case, we have 10,000, actually 20,000 plus suppliers. How do we make sure that our suppliers are healthy? I also heard suppliers and supplier suppliers. So we have like a tiering system. We have like different critical components as well as assembly. And we want to make sure that we understand everything about our critical you know, key suppliers in terms of their financial health. And then given that we're a big CSR, you know, like uh, you know, any kind of a practices, labor practices, child labor practices, we want to make sure that we know before the world knows. So that's where we are, able, we are pulling together a lot of uh, you know, like available information, web scraping, Twitter feeds, sometimes some of them uh, you know, uh, subscribed uh, data. We pull them together. We also you know, combine our certification and uh, compliance data, and then we are able to create a information outlet for our buyers and commodity managers and our procurement folks and also our uh, manuf you know, manufacturing and supply chain leaders to understand uh, with a news feed what is happening. So that is primarily a cognitive engine, and uh, we have a natural language processing that takes all this information, creates an ontology by supplier, by feature, and then we pull that all together so that we know what is happening. So a few examples of that. So this is a, you know, when we look at our modeling, we look at, we start out with our supply chain network. Is our network optimized? What are the key points that we need to be monitoring. 
how do we manage inventory, whether it's a multi-echelon or a line inventory across our factories? We build this model, and our goal is, we are still working on this, our goal is to hand off this to our suppliers so that they are running this, they own this model, and they provide the input to us that feeds into our visualization layer so that I'm in Phoenix, Arizona, I know what is happening in, you know, like in a particular, you know, let's say Shenzhen in China, one of my ODM suppliers. I would have, again, the dashboard, but what I call as the interactive dashboard that I can see. Also, we will be able to run simulations to see whether if there is a demand supply alignment, this feeds into our planning tool as well. So, and then we also have, you know, like deep dive models inside the factory, meaning that means we got to understand what our supply network looks like in the first slide. Now we're really looking at what our manufacturing process and flow looks like within the factories. What are the critical constraints? In fact, there was a, this all started with, with a couple of years ago when uh, one of the supply chain directors came to me and uh, uh, she said, hey, this particular supplier is asking for a $4 million, because we also supply, support their lines, asking for a $4 million capex on this particular tool. So my question was, okay, what's the utilization on this particular tool and how many, you know, like how many products are going through this? Uh, so the answer was not very clear. So we went back to the supplier and, you know, like it was not very clear. So we ended up, I had a modeler go build this model quickly and uh, it actually within a quarter time. We came to know that that particular equipment that they were asking for, $4 million, was utilized at 58%. Because they're dedicating it to certain products and then they were not leveraging it across the board, they were feeling the constraint. So we were not only able to resolve that constraint for them, we were able to save that $4 million in that particular example because they didn't need the tool there for that. So this is how, one example, so we are using this in a particular way, and now we expect that they provide this kind of information, whether it is a TPT, the cycle time, whether it's a utilization, the availability. All those things feeds into our system, so it goes into our capex, you know, into our capital equipment system so that we know what to buy, when to buy. The second one I'm talking about is visualization. All of us want to know what is happening, right? We trust our folks, but we want to know what's going on not only know what's going on, but I also want a way to interact and try out different things. So this particular picture, you know, taking the simulation model, interfacing that with the right you know, decision points or what do you call the KPIs. Maybe it's the days of inventory, or maybe you know, like if you're looking at a, a, a overall factory, you could be looking at utilization. If you're looking at a supply network, you may be looking at you know, multi-echelon points, right? So what you're looking at is using basic control chart techniques, using forecasting methods, and also using prediction capability. We are actually able to first map our network, put the different KPIs, and then connect them with the algorithms. And then at every given point, we not only know what is happening, we can actually project forward, saying, you know, like three weeks from now, up to a quarter, what and how things are going to change. We took this information at, from the product level. Now we are able to take the product, look at the bill of material, look at the key components, look at the lead time, and then we are able to connect it to the component supply chain. Now we are leveraging this for procurement and planning simultaneously in one system. And Intel, you know, like we're dedicated to making IoT work. In fact, we have an IoT group with, you know, like where we focus on industrial. We provide not only uh, different products, compute capabilities and sensors and integration. We're also leveraging the IoT capability internally across the board for supply chain. Uh, you heard about, uh, you know, like this morning, how uh, McCain, uh, you know, like, Christine, you were, you were saying how it is used, right? So the way we are using uh, IoT primarily in the manufacturing is for predictive PMs. We have the signals coming from the tool that indicates this particular, you know, bath, you know, with the chemical, you know, like it's 
uh, instead of you know, changing it on a scheduled basis, we know that based on a performance, you know, like it needs to be changed, for example, or a particular robotic arm, you know, based on the location, it is indicating that I need to go change the bearing. That means that sends a signal to our uh, you know, SAP-based system that tells me that I need to have, to have this component for my PM that I'm pulling in. And if I don't, then it sends a signal to the procurement indicating that I need to have these components. And what we have done is we have developed RPAs, robotic process automation, to kind of look at each one of them and connect them across the board. It's not completely elegant yet. We're still working on it. But that is, you, you can get it, right? I mean, our path to digitization and autonomation Automation is kind of going that way. And in fact, in logistics, in warehouse, it's very interesting. We recently had drones, you know, like programmed drones, they take off and then they go look at different, uh, you know, like inventories. And then they kind of, you know, kind of communicate the information. And in our subfab, we have thousands of gauges. We were actually manually going and looking at those gauges on a scheduled basis. Today, we have drones going and they're scheduled. They go, they take a picture, convert from you know, like an image to a digital picture, and then the information goes right into our system. So this is how we are able to leverage some of the IoT in our day-to-day -day supply chain applications. And the last one is primarily, how do I know my sourcing, procurement, my supplier ecosystem is healthy? The questions that are spread around the cognitive computing-based sourcing intelligence is something that all of you in supply chain ask about. Can we find new supplier for commodities? Are there emerging skills that I need to be aware of? Do I have an alternate supplier that I can go with? Is my supplier at risk? Because financially, there is some issues there. Are there you know, any kind of a CSR, corporate social responsibility kind of issues? So just to name a few. And uh, so the, what we have done is, as I mentioned earlier, I'm only showing the sustainability, but we have kind of developed it across the board. It's also interesting when we start going on this journey, you know, like everybody wants similar things, but the way they want to consume it is going to be slightly different. So we create a platform of what kind of data, that, uh, you know, in this particular case, it's primarily unstructured data what kind of sources we need to go to. And then the, the critical work actually happens when we have to decide what kind of ontology we need to create so that it kind of caters to the different needs of our different folks. And then how do they want to consume it in what fashion? And so this is, you know, I'm kind of sharing with you different news and tweets. And in fact, we also have uh, translators because we get information from Mandarin. We get information from, you know, from, uh, uh, like uh, the different sources, different languages. So we have a translator that converts it, and then end of the day, we are able to consume the information. Like for example, this is something like a forced and bonded dashboard that people use. And what it do, what it's doing right now is, it's anytime you create something for your users, they're going to ask you the moment you answer their question, they they will ask, come back and say, what if? So that is the reason why, in the simulation that I was sharing with you, we had a sliders. We don't want to just answer the question you have. We're going to give you a range. That way, you can answer the questions yourself. That way, we can go and work on something else. Similar to that, what, what you're seeing is actually a video of the actual tool that is being deployed. Something similar to, you know, probably you've seen it in other applications like this, but for us, this is very critical. We actually do the word, word cloud. They can click on it. They can go look at a particular instance. And you can also see that one particular supplier, in this case, we were almost negotiating, you know, like upwards of, uh, um, I don't know, tens of millions of dollars. And uh, this information proved us that, you know, like showed us that that supplier was looking at merging with another supplier, which was not necessarily favorable to us. So that changed the equation for us completely. And uh, the, you know, like the indirect supply chain director came and uh, basically said, you saved us millions of dollars on this one. So it is so gratifying to see these kind of tools are not just you know, like, uh, science-based, but we are applying, we are using. And now, in fact, uh, we have a couple of people putting an entire roadmap to take this across the entire supply chain. 
And now uh, the sales and marketing folks are looking at, hey, I would like to create, a, from a CRM, I would like to create something cognitive so that I'm, you know, like market sentiments and everything, I want to be ahead of that. So we're kind of working with that aspect as well. And uh, I think this is also, you know, like another big deal that we're looking at is the disruption. And uh, as it happens, we should know. And we also you know, subscribe to a lot of other information, but this kind of compiles and provides knowledge. And then we are also now trying to take this information, put that along with our planning and our you know, needs, and then we're trying to do some prediction based on what we see from this, uh, from this unstructured data so that we have a better uh, information to make our plans. So as Bharat was saying, it comes back to What's the business value? How do you know what you've done has worked? So we measure. I mean, we start out with the projects. It's, I don't even call this as a project anymore because this, this is a capability. Because if it's a project, it starts and ends. If this is a capability that it's going to evolve as we go. But we have to keep you know, providing incremental value. right? So we look at some of the things we have done here, you know, increased velocity decreased supply chain interruptions. In fact, uh, it was very interesting that the decreased supply chain interruptions actually ended up giving us a revenue uplift. When we started working on some of this, you know, like that was not necessarily one of the criteria, but it happened. It was a great positive surprise. Increased productivity and quality and decreased inventory. And as an example, on this sourcing intelligence, on that particular case that I was sharing with you, you know, like when we put this together, there was a $30 million cost avoidance. And uh, that will be expected to increase further once we roll it across the board. And then 4% reduction from better negotiation, as I was mentioning to you, that was a big impact for us. So I'm on my last slide, Laura, so I don't know whether I overshot, but uh, what's the takeaway for us? Folks, the challenge is going to continue. In fact, that's what is keeping us you know, making us wake up and go to work and then, you know, like enjoy those challenges, right? So, but identifying the right opportunities and then looking at data versus, hey, I have a great tool, I'm going to go work on it. No, what is the opportunity? What's the question I'm trying to solve, right? And then how is it going to be valuable? You also heard about ROI and everything. You know, what's the impact? Am I looking at some of the things that we do is incremental value. Some of the things we're doing is disruptive. So disruptive means we probably have to make sure that we have some, you know, like blessing from, you know, like what we call as the informed risk taking. And it also comes with the credibility. If you have done it before, you've provided the value, they know that, hey, you know, a managed team can go do this. And uh, plan to modernize. That means this is another ta you know, thing that we talked about, right? Upskilling the talent, hiring right, and then having the right technology. Don't be kind of you know, like into the box of, oh, my, my enterprise system does not let me do it. Well, that's not stopping us, right? And maximize value and scale. So the way we look at it is I kind of, you know, we kind of started the concept. If it is an innovation, we do the design, develop, and then do the proof of concept pilot. And then we go partner. We heavily partner with our IT and others to scale, to integrate, and sustain. So that's the kind of model we work with. <laughs> 